Hi. I think we're live. <laughs> hey, my hey. first Twitch streaming. Uh, you're first. Oh, well, welcome. This is my fourth, so we're all we're all new at this. <laughs> uh, Douglas just joined the room right before I pushed uh, start, so we haven't even said hello yet or welcome. So hello and welcome. I'm so not, so glad to meet you. Thanks. Yeah. Really excited to talk about the topic today. Yeah, good. I'm glad. We'll, we'll get to that. I'd, I'd love, to, Sheila, if you could tell us um, how you and Douglas know each other, uh, What's the overlap? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Douglas is my postdoc friend. Well, and also friend <laughs> generally. <laughs> um, well, we're both postdocs. Um, and I actually met, I think I met, first met Douglas at an American Geophysical Union Early Career Scientist Conference, which is like a one day event. And then I had forgotten that we met there and then we met as like NC State postdocs. Um, but the, I guess what confused me in not remembering that I had met Douglas is Douglas is a NC State postdoc, but he's based in Asheville. Yeah. Um, at the North Carolina Institute for Climate Studies, Climate Science. You did it right the first time. Okay, Climate Studies. <laughs> So yeah, did I miss anything else, Douglas? I think we met before the conference, uh, before the uh, early career conference. Uh, I went to your poster. I think oh, we. I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's the same. It's the same conference, but <laughs> I think we first met at the poster, and then we met at the early career conference or the uh, networking events like okay. that, with hydrology and like different uh, sections together. It's the trivia oh. events, right? Oh. That's great. Well, we're, we're so glad to have you with us, Douglas. Um, I'll do some introductory stuff here. So this is the fourth and maybe final, uh, hopefully not final, but uh, the fourth in our series of open science and reproducibility um, with my co-host, uh, uh, Sheila. And thanks, as always, for anyone who's watching or listening now or catching up later. Uh, we've covered so much ground over these four weeks, uh, drank so much tea. Sheila, what, what do you have? Uh, in honor of Douglas joining us, I have Asheville <laughs> Tea Company uh, Lemon Yaupon. I don't know if I said that right. It's very tasty. That's really nice. I I don't think I have any tea from them, but because I, I still have a lot of tea in my in my cabinet, so I don't need to buy new tea <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> And this was a gift from my advisor, Natalie Nelson. Oh, so awesome. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Natalie. Natalie's like our unofficial sponsor of the, of the, the stream. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, and of course, I went across the street to our friends at Global Village and I, and I got a, a Darjeeling. And I think this may be the first time I have actually ever had a Darjeeling. And it's, uh, I'd say it's milder than I expected it to be. So it's, it's, it's very good, but, but that's what I'm drinking. Um, the, the two other parts of our conversation today are uh, diversity and documentation. And uh, as always, uh, lots of information is in our um, GitHub repo, which the moderator should drop in the chat any minute now. Um, shall we start? Well, uh, the you can see on the screen, I have the um, a, oh, Douglas, I don't know if you can see this. So well, I'll give you, um, on our Twitch channel, you can kind of glance at what's happening, but it might, I'll put it in the chat here, um, but it might, you, you might need to mute the Twitch channel because otherwise you'll hear two things at the same time. But um, on the screen, you all should see a, um, an umbrella about open scholarship, uh, a, a phrase that, you know, open research, open scholarship, open science, depends how you want to call it. But under the umbrella are a variety of things that, um, the people that created this um, graphic, but also lots of us are, are starting to recognize as um, the, the broad spectrum of what open research covers. Uh, of course, open educational resources, open data, open access, um, and then um, community science they have under here, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I think the, um, 
this this graphic came out of the product of, of some other conversations kind of across across the globe about um, what was really possible with open if we were talking about open research it's not just about the products right it's about the people and the process um, and that that combined really neatly with um, necessary and uh, and kind of progressive future thinking conversations about equity diversity and inclusion in the academy which we should have been talking about for a long time now um so that's that's where this all uh, came together and um and where we will take the conversation but before we do that uh we should talk about uh or let's ask some questions about darjeeling uh douglas could i ask you and i'll, I'll kind of click through some links here um ha, do you do you like darjeeling what's your favorite kind of tea do you like darjeeling so I have a long history with tea because I grew up in China. And when I grew up um, as a kid, I hated tea. <laughs> I just like uh, old fashioned plant water and those like cold water, not even warm water in the winter. <laughs> That's when my parents think I'm a weirdo. <laughs> and, uh, but, and I gradually started liking tea in college time because a lot of times you're crunching the hours for finals and other things. That's when, and you can only drink so much coffee so <laughs> that's when i started drinking tea and i started with those really low quality like tea bag you can you can find and every holidays when i go back home my parents will always i put a couple bags of tea mm. into my luggage and i will bring it back to uh to university and now my most favorite uh, my favorite tea is um as a black tea and it's it's from china yeah, I, I still have some in my home right now. So I will not uh, admit that I brought it from China <laughs> <laughs> on the internet. Uh, but and that's the tea I really like. And I haven't heard that jarring before. So <laughs> I did some my homework before coming today. And I've, it's a, it sounds like it's really um, rare tea and it's from uh, parts of India, which they call it the champagne of tea. I mm -hmm. think that's really interesting to 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 see the uh, Wikipedia article and which and also goes back to the history how the Nigerian started, which is a fascinating read. Thanks for allowing me to have the chance to learn more about tea. Yeah, I, I learned a lot too, uh, Sheila. You, uh, what's your what did, what homework did you do on Darjeeling? Yeah, I found this article in the Spruce Eats blog, which the thing that I thought was interesting was there's different like flushes yeah. of the tea for different seasons. And like, I think I've actually only tried the first flush, which is the more milder mm -hmm. sounding one, but I would be interested in trying the other ones that they had um, in this article. And yeah, moderator, if you could put that article in the chat, that would be great. Yeah, it's already in there. She she's ahead oh, of us. Awesome. Yes, of course. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm gonna try to do this my 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 research. I'm gonna show you how I do it really quickly, and it goes from um, excitement to sort of I wouldn't say worry, but there's a complicated history behind this tea. Okay, you ready? Here we go. So I start, of course, at our our library's website. Uh, and did a search just for Darjeeling, and it uh, comes up with um, uh, articles, books and media, uh, other ways my brilliant colleagues we could get help from. Uh, so I found first that there, um, Darjeeling is one of a few teas that has reached, oh, what's this thing called? Has a... Um, uh, Oh, it's it's part of a register of protected designations and protected geographical indications. So Darjeeling, you can only call something Darjeeling tea if it comes from that region of, of Bengal and India. So um, the article that I was looking at was about a using, what is this, near-infrared spectra spectroscopy to authenticate Darjeeling tea um, because it can only be from this one region. Um, uh, Colin, uh, librarian Colin says, otherwise it's just sparkling tea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, that was fascinating to me, uh, that there, there is a, like, 
It's like uh, oh, there's a cheese. Oh, Gouda, Gouda cheese uh, from from the Netherlands is from a specific town, and it, it has a or per- bourbon. Our bourbon, Kentucky bourbon, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Okay, so then I went deeper. So okay, this is fun. Uh, uh, you know, near infrared spectroscopy to look at the protected origin status uh, granted to Darjeeling tea. Um, which was interesting to learn about. And some of the reason that they say, this is, uh, I guess, through an EU body that they do this. Some of the reason they say they do this is to start to find um, or to create a, a legal protection for against misuse and protect the, the growers and the, um, the people who are working the, the, the tea. Then I found this book. Oh, my session has expired, but there's a um, an anthropological study that's in our um, our show notes about what, what's the title? The Darjeeling Distinction: Labor and Justice on Fair Trade Tea Plantation Plantations in India, and it turns out. It's not great <laughs> that despite the fact that it has a protected status and um, you know fair trade is is doing what it can, um, the the humans who are working on uh, picking this tea uh, aren't as protected as we all might hope. So then I went to the director of open access journals and started to learn a little bit more about um, the interrelation between poverty and hypertension, a study that was done in Darjeeling with the tea workers. Um, another one about respiratory morbidity in the Indian tea industry. So um, there, there's some complications with uh, f- food from other places, which led me to uh, the, the bright light that I want to end this with uh, is to point to one of our colleagues here at NC State. Um, Duarte Mores uh, runs a group called the People First Tourism Lab. Um, and uh, a lot of the work that, that Duarte and, and, and his lab and colleagues do is to, um, to find ways to mitigate and actually to empower communities where, where tourism is a thing or agritourism or uh, whatever to um, empower the, the, the people who are doing um, that work, uh, who, are, who live in that area, and then invite people who tend to be tourists to come to those areas to actually engage with the life and the humans that live there. Um, so I wanted to, it's a complex history, but um, Duarte is doing great work. And I'll call out that he was actually a um, a graduate of our open incubator program in the libraries. And um, you can see here that they call out in their sort of lab um, manifesto that they have a commitment to openness, openness and prox- process and praxis, sharing results of research as openly as possible while remaining as closed as necessary to protect the humans in the center of the work. Okay, so that was really long, but um, it felt really important to, to say that um, Darjeeling has a, has a complex history. And now, um, what do we say about diversity uh, and or documentation and open science. Do you want to explain reproducibility first? Oh yes, of, co- of course. Uh, yeah, the, the reason that we're even doing it, thanks Sheila, that's why you're the co-host. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reason we're doing any of this is because we have um, a, a great colleagues at the University of Oxford who came up with a, a great idea for um, gathering people together, people like Sheila and Douglas or Cassidy last week, um, to talk about um, what's happening in open science. Uh, It's kind of imagined as a journal club. We're doing it a little differently through this format, but there are um, reproducibility um, journal clubs across the globe, and we encourage you all to um, find your local one or start your own local one. It's at reproducibility.org. So, uh, where do we go? I, I didn't really, it feels like such a bummer to start that way, but it's so important. I think it's yeah, I, I just have one question for um, Michael before we move on. It's when you choose a T-type, did you specifically find this digerium paired with the diversity topic that we want to talk about today or it's a random coincidence. Yeah, no, it was a coincidence. I was thinking of um, 
words that I ha- I hear or are used in open science, so like contributorship and chai, like we did uh, last week. Uh, Earl Grey literature was just a funny uh, thing that we did in the first week. But um, I, I, I have uh, been aware of and doing uh, my part to include conversations about diversity in, in my own work around open science. So there was like an alliteration, the D thing, right? Diversity and documentation are things that I um, talk about and involve in my work. And then I was trying to find a D name for a T. (laughs) So it's really kind of fortuitous that we um, talk about diversity and inclusion. And it just so happens that um, this specific T has uh, a connection there. Yeah, good question. And I apologize that my foster dog just decided he wanted to eat his food after I put the food in his bowl for four hours already. <laughs> so if you hear anything, that's him. <laughs> that's no no problem at all. This is uh, this is the Zoom life. We're we're all yeah we're all whole whole people with with other things living with us creatures. <laughs> um, so Sheila or Douglas, both of you, I, I don't work as a scientist and um, any room that I walk into, I take up a certain space because of this, right? I'd love to um, hear what it's like for you. What's it like to be uh, a scientist, uh, doing open scientist, um, representing your, your work and yourself um, in this this you know a, a, a sub area of a of a field that you work in. Let's do you want to go first. Sure, and I think it actually like relates very well for one of the motivation that I decided I want to switch my um, um, field of study from my college time to uh, my graduate program. So I was trained as a statistician. Um, in college. And um, after, uh, during that time, I was involved in a couple uh, environmental conservation groups during, uh, in the college. And that's when also the IPCC, the Intergovernment uh, Panel on Climate Change, mm-hmm. uh, released their report. And then there's all the scandals, the, not scandals, I would say, but uh, the, the report on the media that the climate denial uh, deniers have uh, find they called evidence that the climate scientists or the people who are doing the assessments hmm. manipulated data. So the uh, com- so the results are um, a, a, a manufacturer to serve the purpose of that report. So I think that brings up the topic of, of reproducibility really uh, to the core where you need to make sure that all your analysis uh, um, can be reproduced if anyone wants to question your um, your process or your motivation of doing that. And so with everything documented and um, can be reproduced by anyone, that can really be an important step, especially for those topics that may be uh, politicized hmm. or like may have like more like distrust from the public in certain time of the human history. So it like increased confidence uh, in, to the public. So I think that's a really important topic and why I really think that uh, reproducibility is important. So Sheila, do you have anything you want to share with your research? Before I say something I also wanted to ask you about your experience with um, ESIP which I'll let you define the acronym there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, ESIP is a um, nonprofit organization. Um, the full name is Earth Science Information Partners. It started 20 some years ago and is, was fun, is founded uh, by uh, NOAA, which is a National Oceanic mm-hmm. and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Administration and, and NASA. Um, I think everyone knows that with the Mars rover who just landed, uh, landed like last week, and also USGS, <laughs> United States Geological Survey. And there's a group of really passionate um, earth science uh, data um, users, uh, providers, and also engineers who 
uh, work together, try to make the earth science data useful for the society can provide value and also make the data um, open and also the fair principle. It also uh, is played a significant role in the, in the fair principle as well. I think it fits really well in our conversation today. And I was their community fellow uh, for the past two years, hmm. and which uh, I learned a lot from the people who are in that community. And so for anyone who are interested in data informatics or data science, as well as just overall open science, I highly recommend to, uh, to find that organization and learn what they have been doing. And they also did a lot of fabulous work on data citation and software citation, et cetera, which they provide the guidelines mm. and uh, all different important uh, materials you can, everyone can, can find useful. That's great. I, I'd not heard of that group and, and um, data and software citations, I think are great examples of, of documentation for um, continuing open science and growing open science. So that's really cool. Uh, our, our moderator has links in the, in the chat if people want to look at that organization. Yeah, I also have a little connection to ESIP. I, um, and this goes along with like the open science training that we talked about earlier this month, Micah. I participated in Environmental Data Initiative Summer Hackathon, <laughs> which is put on through ESIP, I think. They're somehow connected. I don't know all the specifics, but um, so that was a really great experience for me because I um, was like, we had a week uh, where we were, we met other people that were interested in um, doing some sort of initiative to increase like openness or accessibility of data sets. In this case, we were trying to make an R package. So a, a bunch of functions in R for researchers to be able to like play with data one data sets uh, bef without having to like download the whole data set they could do some like exploratory analysis using like an interactive application that we had programmed through R. <laughs> so we had like a week to like kind of work on this and in that week I like really learned a lot about like collaborating on GitHub more than I have ever learned, just like, you know, collaborating with myself on GitHub. Uh, definitely, if people are looking for experience and like collaborating um, and they're not getting that through like their own lab, they could check out the environmental data initiative hackathons, which they might be virtual now. And they usually happen in the summer. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I guess like, my, I don't know if I said this before, but like in grad school, I took a data management class that was co-taught by the li like a library staff member and a faculty member in, at that time it was like uh, the Department of Natural Resources. And so they like co-taught this mini class and I started to learn, you know, about data management there. And then that sort of like, Data management is like, I think, very connected to like data and science reproducibility. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of, you know, snowballed and I kept connecting with other librarians and just kind of kept going with it, meeting other people like Douglas that are interested in <laughs> open science and talking more about it. So, yeah, I think that's how. I think Shira I just opened a wormhole that. <laughs> I want, I want to talk like, yeah, I think um, one thing that I found really um, passionate about after I joined the ESIP as a community fellow is that I find that the current graduate school training for a lot of students do not necessarily uh, provide enough skill set for people who are managing their own data. Hmm. I think from my personal experience, I can say that for sure, I had so many episodes where uh, when the review uh, come back from a manuscript and I was just like, wait, which data set did I use for that analysis and mm. which version? And, and when I go back to my folder and looking at, there's so many different um, uh, version of data and then this the updated version and version two and final. And yeah, yeah. Final updated. And 
I have to, <laughs> I have to arrange it by date to uh, to figure out which one is the final data set I use. So I think they need to have a lot more training on the data management and also the open science practice. And uh, oftentimes, I found those training are usually um, falling on the shoulder of libraries, and those are not necessary. I'm, not saying the library is not doing a good job, but just a lot of times people don't necessarily know where to look for those resources. And mm -hmm. if that can be incorporated into the curriculum for the grad school and in each program, that would be much more efficient and much more necessary than like falling on the shoulder of uh, library librarians to uh, find uh, the time where they can do that workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, I'm, you 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 you've hit the nail on the head, Douglas. I, I it seems like a lot of that is is coming to libraries. I think because our interest in it, um, like the um, uh, yeah, like we we are organizers of information and knowledge, and and we're starting to our our field generally, and I think across many fields, starting to think about data as something that can be organized better, right? So a lot of that um, that work has come to libraries and, and librarians, and we have a, a great support team here at, at NC State um, for research data management um, uh, generally. And, and I did want to call out that um, as you all were talking, I was reminded that um, because and. I'm I'm so impressed by what's happening in the, in the earth and geosciences for you know that you are are, are both beneficiaries of. Um, there's a a group called the Code for Science and Society that has recently put out a call a sort of a grant call for virtual event grants that are supposed to be focused on. We, I'll read their call, their call here and it should come in the chat in a minute. Um, they are supporting communities with grants for virtual events focused on improving and connecting research-driven data science tools, practices, and communities themselves. Um, and they're especially encouraging international applicants and uh, events held in non-English languages. So there is now, and this is you know a, a product of COVID and the, the world that we're living in. Um, it's possible to. Um, get the kind of training that isn't necessarily in graduate programs yet um, on data science skills, reproducibility, open science, um, and groups like the Code for Science, uh, Code for science and Society ha have funding, funding available for people to, um, to put in a, a call and, um, and say, oh, I'd like to uh, host one, um, you know, somewhere uh, in the world, which would be online. Um, so I, I think that that's that's um, that's a great resource. Um, I did also want to mention that we I, I didn't say Sheila I didn't tell you where we were going to take our our trip our traveling tour uh, today, but we are right now in Asheville, North Carolina, looking over the uh, yeah we wanted to go visit Douglas, Beautiful. looking over the the city and yeah it, this is the first sunny day we've had in North Carolina in week and a half two weeks so it's wonderful that we can um, see that uh and and glad that our viewers can see it also we'll visit some other places we're, we're basically taking a tour across north carolina uh for the next uh, half hour or so um oh douglas where are you yeah that's a virtual background of the building i work in nice. if we are in person so that's the downtown Asheville where you can overlook in the background is mountain and there's a sunset time. Yeah, L love that city. It's beautiful over there. Um, so Sheila, both. So actually, both. So both of you all are postdocs. Um, what are the? <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but what what are the barriers? Right. What are, what's holding you back, or what? Um, not holding you back, but what what are the the barriers that you face when you are trying to do open and reproducible work. You want to go first, Douglas? Or should I, I give it a shot? Um, I'm just one, the first thing coming to my mind is the um, infrastructure. <laughs> and I think, may, especially when you try to make your research um, reproducible, that you need to provide a lot of things that to make that reproducible reproduction process possible. Hmm. 
like for example, the model you're using the, uh, or the, mo the code you're using and then the, the data was used in your uh, model and analysis developments. And oftentimes for people who are doing, especially those large scale like analysis or large scale like studies, the infrastructure to support such work may not necessarily be there. Hmm. So that would be, especially when we are, um, I'm, I'm located in the uh, Asheville because there's a NOAA's a National Center for Environmental Information, which is our uh, federal collaborator here. And they have the world's like largest archive environmental data. And um, mo all the data are open, but not everyone can hmm. um, have the computing power to process all the data. So if people who are from the developing country who need to reproduce the work and they may not have the computing power hmm. to do that. So I think that's a barrier. And I see, especially when we want to make the open science applicable to, to the entire world instead of just focusing on um, in the United States. That's a great point. Yeah, Sheila, anything to add? And I'm gonna transport us to Raleigh while you speak. I think for me, like the two biggest things are like training, like just not, or like not even knowing where to start. Like just this past week, uh, one of my friends that is still a grad student in um, the lab that I was doing my grad school work in, like reached out to me and was like, hey, I saw you were tweeting about open science, but like, I wanna know more about this, but I have no idea where to start. <laughs> So like, you know, you, you're in this lab group um, at a university uh, or you're an undergrad or something, you know, or you're a postdoc like in the lab group, but you just don't know, like there's so much information, so many groups, like you don't know where to start. And like, I find that even with like learning R, like I always tell people like, if you're learning R, like I always recommend this book or like just start here and then like try to, cause like sometimes people are just like, where do I even start? There's just so much. And then like, yeah, just like knowing about preprints, like hmm. these like this like lingo, you know, knowing about Git, GitHub, Git repositories, like repositories, like stuff like that. Um, and then like how to use them. And then the second thing, so training, the second thing I often struggle with is like resources. Hmm. And I'm talking mostly about like funding to get these, like for example, like open access fees can be quite high. Yeah. Like I was recently trying to, you know, persuade some of my collaborators to pay the open access fee, which was like at a minimum, like, three thousand dollars at a maximum five thousand dollars which like like my lab uh in grad school we are very like frugal about how we spent like the money that we had from grants and like three thousand dollars can buy a lot of very new centrifuge tubes yeah. you know so like <laughs> like do you <laughs> Yeah, Douglas, did you want to say something? I just raised my hand because I want I I, I have a, a article or the uh, journal policy, which actually is quite interesting, uh, regards to open science and reproducibility. So I'm gonna put a, the link in the chat for the stream on the on the Twitch. Also, I'm gonna send it here in our uh, Zoom space. So if you go to this um, web page, that it's um, it's a reproducible results policy from this journal of water resource planning and management, where they said that if you have a reproducible results section and it has been it has passed a review by their associate editor for reproducibility, and then you'll get a free or discounted open access rates. Wow! So which is a, a, it's a it's really I think this is a policy I I saw first time like last year and which is really uh, interesting like development because it combines both the open access and make it more affordable for some, uh, for some people as well as uh, uh, the reproducibility in the results. 
Yeah, that that's that's the first I've seen of that. Also, that's really cool. Um, uh, uh, go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of so. I also I know I found I saw this recently through the NC State Libraries. I think they had an announcement about PLOS mm -hmm. uh, that they would cover open access fees or, or some maybe I don't want to. But it was like some, there's some like relationship between NCC and PLOS with regards to open access fees, which I was like, yes. But to kind of go back to the experience that I had recently, I, I think as a postdoc, you're often working on PhD work still, like still publishing um, PhD work. And like most, P, most postdoc advisors like anticipate a postdoc is going to be working on like PhD, uh, like getting those final PhD papers out hmm. um, on their spare time. And sometimes they'll even be flexible enough that give you time to work on that during working hours. Um, but I think what makes it hard is that like in my case is like I'm working on this PhD project and I like it's like maybe a couple years out and the funding is like no longer mm -hmm. like available because, you know, it just can't get extended that far. And then I can't like, I don't have like very much power as a postdoc working on like old work to like help my, you know, old PhD collaborators like find support for, for yeah, that. Yeah. So it's like you're kind of like in a hard place. Like I don't know where to get the money for, for this. Mm -hmm. Like obviously can't ask my new boss too because it's very unrelated to their work. So it's just like that's a struggle that I have right now at least as a postdoc. Yeah, that that's really great great to hear and saddening to hear. And I could talk for about an hour about why that situation exists right now, because it is really closely related to library budgets and how we've um, bought subscriptions over 20, 30 years as, as the scholarly record became digital. Um, but I think I'll start, I'll just, I'll just kind of, <laughs> I'll try to be short and say um, that when I get that, so that's a question we get regularly in the library. I want to do open access and I can't afford it. The response that I always give, and Douglas kind of uh, stole my thunder there, but is that probably in the, the journal publication contract, there are lots of ways that you can already make your work open without ever paying a dime to anyone. So what I, myself and, and colleagues that I work with in the library, what we always try to do is to find those ways to do open um, that doesn't put more money into the pockets of the major publishers. Um, I think that um, societies and associations like the American Geophysical Union um, are, are trying to find ways to make that process more equitable also, um, but we're still, um, it's still not great. Um, the PLOS announcement is, is Basically, lots of publishers and libraries uh, who, who like have the money that buys this kind of research, um, either back from publishers or on the front end to support you all, everybody's trying new models to try to figure out a way to, to make the money work where, where knowledge can ac actually circulate and it isn't a barrier to postdocs or um, our colleagues from low and middle income countries, right? Um, the models are developing right now. Um, we're not sure how it's going to shake out yet. So uh, I, I hate to hear that because I, I, I want you all to be able to, when you, when you choose open, when it's appropriate and right for your, for the paper, or your career, I, I want to make that possible for you. Um, but we're still in the middle of a, an old model. Yeah. I, th I think the, at least for me, the solution to this problem that I was facing with like not being able to afford it, um, was to put it on a non-for-profit preprint server. Right. So like that is always an option and you still retain the rights to the, you know, the non-journal formatted paper. Um, so yeah, just posting that and then making sure that you include the link to that in the paper mm -hmm. so that people can read the, and, and also in the supplement 
because typically the supplements are free to access for mm -hmm. people. Right. Um, so that's like one way to get around it is like, yeah, put the link for the preprint in the supplement because the supplement is always free for people to access. So. I think since we're on the topic of the uh, publishing and uh, open access fees, and I'm, I'm sure all you are aware of the, the announcement from Nature like <laughs> earlier about charging like $10,000 <laughs> for an open access journal uh, for an open access publication, which yeah. I just feel being attacked. <laughs> um, but like my other colleague who is um, editor or uh, who is uh, doing a lot of editing for the Institute and also for other international uh, reports have brought up a really good point that um, all the journal are not operating um, for as a nonprofit. So they still need to support their ed editorial like staff and things. So there has to be a balance between the fees and um, for the open access to make sure that those journals can still like so, uh, sustain. But I think the $10,000 is just too much. <laughs> and so yeah. many centrifuge tubes. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, Douglas, that's, that's a great point. And I think that part of the reason nature did that was responding to some of what's happening in Europe where they're, they're, there's a thing called Plan S, which is national yep. government funders trying to, they're trying to like set a, a a line and say this is what open access should cost. And I think Nature and the publishing companies are kind of responding to that and pushing back. Um, but yeah, so the, one of the responses that I hear about and read about, and I'm doing my best to make possible, is um, a concept that we're calling. Uh, uh, yeah, it, open infrastructure or community-owned uh, publishing or academy-owned uh, journals. Uh, all those phrases are being used in different contexts. But the the basic idea is that for about 30 years now, we've sort of slowly ceded control of our own literature and circulation of it to commercial companies, publishers. And that worked for a while because they could make things move quickly because they had money and, and you know, uh, big offices. Um, but now maybe because lots of uh, universities are understanding that um, connecting to connecting knowledge to local communities is important and being able to control some of that knowledge. Um, we're asking questions. I think it's mostly coming out of the library field, but library and adjacent fields about what would it look like if um, NC State was, the, I hope no one quotes me on this, but what would it look like if NC State was the publisher of um, leading climate, climate uh, scientific research, um, where the, the papers and data are, are out and available first, right? And then there's a concept that we call an overlay journal where um, we'd start to pull together, oh, this is the, the really good stuff. This is stuff that's really important to coastal resilience. Um, and then, so it's all out and available immediately. And then the journaling that currently happens now actually happens after things are already made open. That's, that's a huge vision. I think it's, you know, still 15 years down the road, but that to respond to some of that, what, what libraries are, are trying to get at is um, what can we take back from commercial publishers and say, hey, actually, this is something that we, we can handle and we can manage. And also, I had some sort of like footprint in the scholarly communication um, a group and two years ago, I attended the 411 oh, yeah. uh, Scholarly Communication Institute. Great. That, that's happening in the summer. And that year was in UCLA. And last year was like virtual. And this year they're also doing virtual summer institute. So there are like a lot of people are like in this field and uh, talking about this topic and trying to figure out a way to solve that. And mm -hmm. the UC system in the past have been like negotiating with the elsewhere of their agreements between the publisher and the um, university systems, which I don't think have uh, well, yeah, I, I did not follow that like development really closely, but I think going back to the topic of equity, mm -hmm. and I think there needs to be um, really a good, in, important conversation about the so-called uh, global south. Because mm -hmm. right now, many um, 
the journal, no matter it's the journal or the, the uh, participant in the publishing uh, process are from the uh, global north, which are typically the uh, winner of those colonial history. And, but uh, a lot of uh, those countries and regions in the, in the so-called global south have been like really in the disadvantage because because of the um, the less they have like less funding and also um, less support to make all the resource like open access and also any publication behind the paywall it's really hard for them to access so it's really hard it's it's difficult and challenging for our knowledge and research uh, um, sharing in those in those uh, regions. Yeah, D Douglas, you're you're you you're like. We're like the same person. You're speaking everything that I. Yeah, I'm so glad we're here that you're here with us today. Um, the example that's, uh, I think I've mentioned Sheila. I've mentioned Leslie Chan several times. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's a, a group in in Canada, um, kind of uh, led by I think it's led by Leslie Chan, um, um, called the Knowledge Equity Lab. And Douglas, everything you just said are the 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 work that they are starting to do. Um, they have, you know, like working groups and research papers, and they've just started a podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago. What's the first topic? Oh, the first topic they did. This was like last week. Um, knowledge by whom, knowledge for whom, and they're talking about exactly that um, that challenge that research as we talk about it right now really means what has happened in the global north and maybe even north america and europe mostly right um although oh there's this really great i'll i'll see if i can find it but leslie chan again did a, a talk where he has this um it's a map of the world but it's distorted by um production of research and resources for research and it's you know like huge in the u.s huge in europe and then sort of a little bit uh bigger in China and India, Germany, and then everything else is kind of just really thin and slim. I'll, I'll try to pull it up here in a second, but um, yeah, so what what do we do? <laughs> Sheila, you know, go ahead. Talk go ahead. about be fair and care? Yes. We do need to. Yeah, that, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I think that that's, um, I, I have a segue that I want to mention is that not just the knowledge and the research, but also that that data itself yeah yeah because i in i'm doing the research on climate and particularly the the temperature uh, data that i'm looking at right now so if you look at the um, station measurements that across the world you can see a clear bias in the north america in europe hmm. and but when you go into the regions like in um in the african continents in the south america um in the in Central Asia, that you see much less or much dense station distribution over there, because historically there's not much uh, uh, support or funding in that, and also they're less populated, so they'll have less resource to station those uh, regions, and that leads to a question that uh, without support, without representative like data, do we have enough? confidence or do we have high certainty about those regional studies using those like state uh, like biased uh, data so that's something i've been thinking a lot and also with regard to the data that's when the fair principle and the care principle comes in and uh sheila do you want to explain what's fair and what's care yeah so yeah, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And my understanding, and then uh, Micah, please correct me, <laughs> and also Douglas, um, <laughs> is that this is originating from like the biomedical fields with an emphasis on like machine readability of data and protection of subjects. Um, in, for example, uh, studies where uh, identity needs to be protect protected. Um, and so having, thing having guidelines in place for like how to or whether to share data in those cases. Um, but yeah, so for FAIR, I often think about like, can a machine read the data or read the documentation? Um, and 
then with care is a fairly new um, set of data principles and data governance principles. CARE stands for Collective Benefit, Authority to Control, Responsibility, and Ethics. And this is from Russo, Carroll, and all. They say the CARE principles for Indigenous data governance, um, CARE, empower Indigenous peoples by shifting the focus from regulated consultation to value-based relationships that position data approaches within indigenous cultures and, and knowledge systems to, be, to the benefit of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. This shift ultimately promotes equitable participation in processes of data reuse, which will result in more equitable outcomes. So care is, I think of as more of the perspective of like protecting like and giving and empowering um, and giving sovereignty to the, the people that you're collecting data from. So in your example, Douglas, those uh, communities in like temp that might have temperature data, like written records or things like that. And how do we um, like give back to them or be in a relationship with them so that both we and them are benefiting from this data that they might have, but we just don't know about yet, you know? Yeah, I think the FAIR principle started with the paper in 2016 on the, on, on the data and then CARE more recent as Sheila said, I think it's 2019. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And recently, there are a lot of conversation, I think, within the American Geophysical Union, <laughs> because a lot of the um, research can relate to the um, indigenous groups uh, across the world, and also the traditional knowledge and from the, from the tribal communities are really, because I heard that one, com uh, one conversation in the last, in 2020, the American Geophysical Union annual meeting is that because we have a really colonial view of the observation, because we think observation should be the, the data that collected using those instruments that are developed. And, but there are thousands of years of like traditional knowledge, um, like written down in those, like either written down in the, in the books or like just remembered and inherited from uh, within the community. And we are not necessarily viewing those as a, useful observation and how I think care principle is a really important step to um, help us to move to the next stage and how we can um, co-develop the knowledge with the indigenous groups which are uh, benefiting for them and also share the knowledge and make it useful for the uh, society in general. Just brilliant. Should, that's what we. That's what we should do. Um, I have on the on the screen. I've been clicking as, as you all were talking, but on the screen I have. Guess what? Another paper from my buddy Leslie Chan, um, where this was a uh, supported by the government of Canada as a response to UNESCO's call about open science, which UNESCO is sort of forming um, a, a sense of what how they want to uh, support open science, but. Um, in the summary right here, it, it's just echoing what you just said, Douglas, that, that Leslie and his co-authors say, we suggest greater openness to knowledges and systems of thought that come from indigenous peoples, minorities, and cultures from the global south. These knowledges are often ignored or excluded from Eurocentric science, even though they could enrich scientific conversations across boundaries. Um, so, it, okay, this is, it seems like we're these ideas aren't coming out of nowhere. We have the FAIR principles, the CARE principles, the three, two postdocs and a, and a random librarian at NC State. Um, other than having these conversations, which I, I love doing and will continue to do forever, um, what do you all see as um, a, a first next step on this path toward uh, inclusive or equitable open science? 
I just want I see a comment from one of my friend, uh, Nathan, and he has pointed out that um, the part of the care principle includes the limits to access for certain type of knowledge, which is uh, absolutely true. That it's not that we can decide what um, we can access, and also I think one thing that I don't think we have talked about in the um, GitHub page is the relationship. Mm. In the in the especially for the data part, which is the relationship is important, and another um, I think I I'm just like keeping keep like putting new things in there. There's a something called Mukutu, which is a, a management system or technology where it allows you to uh, working with the indigenous groups to um, decide how and how to share or how how to manage that data. Hmm. And, but in that, in an article from National Endowment of Arts or Humanity, they have mentioned that there, that's only a technology, not uh, the relationship. So uh, the relationships still need to be built between the people who are doing the research and people, the, uh, the tribal community who want to work with you. So there's a need to be a mutual agreement and uh, the relationship with those uh, groups. Yep. Uh, yes, totally agree. And we have a couple of examples in the GitHub repo, the Open Cider group, which you can see on the screen now. And Sheila, I think you put OpenScapes on there also as, as sort of communities that are developing around some of these principles and really trying to affect change and, and gathering, you know, people unto themselves. Um, we are oh, always running so short of time, but Sh Sheila, do you have any, um, any last thoughts or things to add? I'm, yeah, I'm still learning a lot about, I think definitely check out the care principles paper. And I know I'm still learning a lot about, you know, best practices for co-production of knowledge and participatory research. And I think there's a lot of information out there um, about that. I still am like asking around for that information. So that's, I think something to like look out for. And I know at least on uh, Twitter and I think they have a, a website, the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network. Mm -hmm. They often have really interest, at least interesting from my perspective conversations about uh, data sovereignty and these care principles. And so I think definitely if you're interested in that, check that out. Um, I guess ending, I'm so sad. This is the last week <laughs> and it was great to do this. And I, I hope we can continue in some way um, and that, yeah, we can keep talking about these things because I think they're important and I will leave it at that. I appreciate all of this. I agree. I'm going to take us back to the beach. We were on the outer, outer banks for a second, but Douglas, while we go to the beach, do you have any um, last thoughts or comments? Um, I think a good conversation is always short and I really enjoy the conversation. Although I have, it's my first like Twitch, like streaming. So I hope I did good. And <laughs> I really like to continue the conversation with um, uh, both of you like offline and hopefully we can do this uh, type of events soon. I, I agree. So let me, I'll, I'll have the last word, I guess. Um, I can't thank Sheila enough for um, taking this strange journey with me. It was started as a, a random meeting about a project and then became, a, oh, we should do a workshop. And now you've invested four hour, you know, four weeks, not to mention all of the um, background work that you did. So um, it, it would have been a, a total failure without you, Sheila. So thank you. And when we can get together in person, I'll buy you teas or beers or kombucha or whatever you want to, to express my thanks. Yeah, Douglas, we'll have to take you to Global Village next time you come to Raleigh. I Definitely, because I was already planning to go to um, NC State for uh, another event in March last year. Mm. And then we all know what happened yeah. after that. Yeah. And we just don't talk about it here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're all looking forward to times when we can be together uh, in person again. Um, yeah, let's let's continue the conversation and invite uh, our, our viewers and listeners to um, 
stay in touch. Uh, Sh- Sheila and I are both on Twitter. Douglas, are you on Twitter also? I am. Um, do you want to speak out your <laughs> handle? At Douglas underscore Rao. That's my Twitter. Yes. Okay. Um, thanks to both of you. Uh, oh, Roxana's here today. Hi, Roxana. Uh, she brags about our channel. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Great to see you again. Uh, thanks again. I will. We'll see everyone when we do thanks, this again. Thanks, moderator Claire. Thanks, Claire, moderator. Thanks. <laughs> and I'm stopping the stream.